Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Congregational Church of Laconia, United Church of Christ. Wherever you are on life's journey, you're always welcome here. And as we begin our time of worship together, let us light the Christ candle, remembering that Christ is with us always. Let us begin our worship. you join me now in our responsive call to worship printed in your bulletins. We come together as a community of faith. We assemble to honor the living God. Through Christ, we become God's holy household. In Christ, we are bound together to be God's people. Our worship is united into oneness by the Holy Spirit. In communion with the Holy Spirit, we celebrate our unity. Would you join me now in our unison prayer of invocation printed in your bulletins? Oh God, we worship you. 
we praise and adore you. We offer you thanksgiving. Together, assembled as we are in this time and place, we hear you in word and we hear you in silence. Listen, we sing, we pray. We thank you for this opportunity for worship. Hear us as we worship through the prayer of our Savior taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How are you this morning? Good. You can sit out here if you'd like, because I'm going to be standing up wandering around. Do you have to write letters in school for assignments? Do you have to write letters? Now, I mean, don't mean A, B, C, but I mean letters like Dear Aunt Carolyn, something like that. Do you, do you do that? I'll say one of the neat things is our grandchildren, at least Grady, he writes letters, and he writes them to us. And the idea is that we're supposed to write back. How many of you like to receive a handwritten letter? Most of us do. Now, how many of you send handwritten letters? Good for you. Good for you. It seems to me like that's something that's fallen by the wayside with technology. You know, instead of sending a thank you letter, we send an email, send a text. Um, but... So there's something about 
sitting down, writing something out by hand, receiving a letter by hand, um, that's special. And, you know, maybe you're saying, well, you know, it's 55 cents to send a letter now. Really? You know, what's the commercial says? Priceless. Receiving such a letter, I think, many times is priceless. Donna has been carrying on a monthly handwritten correspondence with a woman for 22 years, we figured out. Every month she sends us a letter, Donna replies back with a letter. Did you know that most of the New Testament are letters? Most of the writings in the New Testament are letters. What do we call them? Epistles. Right, that's another word for letter. Paul wrote many of those letters. Some Paul wrote on his own. He just wanted to write to a group of people. Sometimes, quite often, Paul was replying to a letter that he had received. Such is the case in today's scripture reading from 1 Corinthians. He received a letter or some news from this person, and he was responding back to it. What I'd like to share with you now is a little imaginative piece about what that letter that Paul received might have been like. So let's see. Dear Paul, much has happened in the three years since you left our fledgling fellowship. Some of it has been good. We have seen an increase in attendance. Lots of new folks of all kinds are showing interest. Some of it, however, in fact, quite a bit of it, is not so good. And this is why I'm writing to you. You, above all others, seem to have had the most enthusiasm and clearest sense of purpose and direction for us when you helped us get off the ground here in Corinth. First of all, there are cliques forming amongst us. It seems that some are claiming special privilege because of who baptized them or because of what special gifts they bring to the congregation. Others come to our fellowship early, eat all the good portions of the meal, and leave little for those who come later because of their servant duties in the household, the family household to which they are bound. And there is more. We have become so divided, it feels like we are a collection of special interest groups rather than the body of Christ, to use a phrase you favored. Any good words of advice would be greatly appreciated. Please address your response to the congregation that it may be read to the entire assembly. Your sister in faith, Chloe. So imagine Paul received that letter and what we're going to hear Paul read in a few minutes is Paul's opening words as he's writing back to this church. Something for you to reflect on as we enter into a time of greeting and fellowship of one another and our youth go to faith formation. Our reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. In your pew Bibles, it's on page 1038. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, and I belong to Christ. Christ. Has Christ been divided? 
Was Paul crucified for you? Or you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crepus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Well, I did baptize also the household of Stephanaeus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. May God add a blessing to our hearing and our understanding of this scripture reading. Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts, our minds to the words we have heard. Give us the courage to hear them in a new, to hear them and to live them out in such a way that they become reality in our own lives. Amen. Now I'll admit, in my little letter there, I took a bit of literary license, um, I know, um, but it is accurate to say that some sort of correspondence had been received by Paul And whether it was a letter or some other way, Paul heard from someone in the house or the family of Chloe, a prominent and perhaps influential member of the Corinthian assembly. She must have been someone Paul trusted and considered reliable. The fellowship in Corinth was a new congregation still learning what it meant to be a congregation and how they were called to live the faith as the ecclesia, or the called out ones, the church. Now to be sure, the first century church in Greece is a world away from our 21st century modern variations of church. They did not have annual meetings. They did not have Sunday schools. They did not have cradle rolls. They did not have boards for this and committees for that, ad hoc standing or squatting. (laughs) Yet, if we suddenly found ourselves transported through time back to the early church, there would be much that would make us feel right at home. They were concerned about people in need like we are, and families without enough food, like we are. They wondered about how to best share the gospel and what were appropriate and safe ways to invite new people to experience their fellowship and hear the stories of Jesus. And they worried about money. The followers of Jesus in Corinth discovered that it wasn't easy to be a church and that they needed all the help they could get. So Paul responds to their questions and through our common concerns, I think speaks a word for us today. What does God want us to do? What does God think we're capable of doing? What does it mean to be a church in our city, town, our social, economic context and historical culture. Now, it can be challenging to gather a diverse community of personalities and live together as a congregation. It can be difficult to take a group of people who have different backgrounds and religious experiences and form a united body of Christ. The church in Corinth was experiencing an early version of a church quarrel. Conflict in churches. Imagine that. Imagine that. We think of the good old days of the church. Instead of feeling united, they, by the faith that they shared, they concentrated on the different paths that brought them to that time and place. 
They compared baptisms with one another as if it was a method of proving some sort of pure spiritual pedigree. Their disagreements were rooted in their diversity. Some members based their faith on their baptism through Apollos. Others claimed higher membership because Paul baptized them. Like modern-day congregations, the Corinthian congregation was made up of individuals of diverse backgrounds. And, in, and unable to find common ground, it would seem they wasted precious time trying to impress one another with their religious resumes. You know, it's like, I think about what it's like today. It's like congregations today where there is a group of people who have always been members of the church. And the others are newcomers to the congregation and perhaps even to the faith. It can lead to questions about who belongs, who is welcome, and who has the right to speak up. The church is called to live as the body of Christ, but being made up of very human beings. Congregations often find it easier to discover reasons to be divided. Churches can argue about big issues, like whether expenditures of money reflect the spirit and mission of Jesus Christ. And we can argue about trivial matters, like which punch recipe to use in funeral receptions. People can disagree about the color of the walls in the nursery room, the choice of hymns, whether or not the ornate historic communion ware should be actually used or kept safe in a lock cabinet. The people in Corinth argued about whose faith was purer and who was a real believer. And so it seems, as we are, as they were, so shall we be, world without end. Amen. But I hope not. I truly hope not. While there is no lack of topics on which we could disagree, Paul encourages the Corinthian congregation to focus on what they share in common, their faith in Christ. You know, when we talk about each other and not about God, we grow smaller. Every time we are tempted to divide ourselves or label ourselves into groups, I'm like this person, but not that one, we weaken the whole. Every time people claim that they, and only they, know the truth about Christ, we are trying to divide Christ among us. And Christ cannot be divided. Paul, in a sense, is saying that the congregation can either talk about the church or can roll up its sleeves and be the church. We can talk about who is the most important in the church, who is the most fervent believer, who has the purer faith, who has the most influence, or we can stand shoulder to shoulder with each other, with our eyes on God, and live and act the church, the body of Christ. We can allow our differences to become the center of our attention, or we can follow Paul's advice and focus on our call to proclaim and live the gospel. The way to be the church of Christ is to keep our focus on Jesus. By this, I mean we can endeavor to do the work that Jesus did. Be as welcoming as Jesus was, be as caring as Jesus was, and live God's love in the manner that Jesus did. We talk about the church being a family. No family's perfect. Show me a family where every member looks exactly the same, thinks the same way, enjoys the same food, votes for the same political party, yet Healthy families, despite all their differences, will come together around a common table for a meal. 
The differences that exist don't have to be a liability. They can be a strength, as Paul will explain later in this letter. The congregation is a collection of very different people. There are some on the top of the game, and some are life-worn and tired. Some struggle with doubt, while others are more confident in themselves. Some are angry, and some are filled with joy and optimism. In spite of, or maybe because of all this, we are called to be the church. We can be a witness to the world where, as a rule, public discourse is crude and self-serving, and people are quick to judge you and me and put us in a certain camp according to their spin on things. Strict boundaries are set out which we are not to cross if we are to be counted with them. Heaven forbid we think on our own. But as I have always said to every church I've ever served, we are a church where you do not have to check your brains at the door. Bring your brains with you. Think, folks. Think. In the church, we are called to follow God as revealed in Jesus. Each one is necessary. Everybody is needed. And together, together, we can live out our call to be the church and to share the, jo- the love of God and the peace of Christ with a world that is in much need of this love. When Paul calls for the believers to have one mind and be of one spirit, he is not asking for uniformity of opinion or exact doctrinal orthodoxy, but to be in agreement on a common commitment to the Christian confession. Paul reminds First Church Corinth and the Congregational Church of Laconia that unity will never be found within the personalities and structure of that organization we call the church. The source of true, lasting unity will not be found inside the brackets of what we call the church, but only in Christ, who is outside the brackets. It is there, and on him we are to keep our focus. Amen. God who calls in Christ, who in Christ calls all persons and all peoples to be the living body of Christ in our world today. We praise you for the potential you have gifted each congregation, and especially ours. But we are all too often of how often we miss the mark. We ask your forgiveness for those times when our focus strays away and we become enamored with our own systems and schemes and human personalities and fail to become all you desire for us. Help us to see beyond the humanness of the church to see Christ's body and spirit alive amongst us. Help us to live into the fullness of the body as we celebrate and lift up each other's gifts. And while we know some have been gifted with a special gift in prayer, All of us can pray, and you will hear our words, and more than our words, the thoughts behind our words and our silence. So hear our prayers for those who are sick. You've heard us lift up many names this morning. 
And also in this midst, we know that there are those who are recovering. And we lift them up for continued strength and recovery. We pray for those who are hurting physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And for those who are grieving. We pray for those who have lost sight of what is important in life and are searching. We pray, O oh God, for those who are searching in this world for a home, for a family, for a place, a simple place of shelter. Be with them and comfort them. And may they find a place out of the cold, out of the snow, the rain, the ice. We pray for the wisdom of all leaders of the world. For we live in a time where it seems that we are always on the edge, on the verge of some sort of disaster, whether it is human caused or related to nature. Help us to be a people of care for one another, whether they are our neighbors in our neighborhood or around the world, across the ocean in Puerto Rico, or wherever there may be disaster. We pray all these things in the name of the one who brought a healing touch to many, an encouraging or understanding look to others, who brought hope to those who had lost it, whose inner light helped many a lost soul rediscover their paths. And still today brings these things to us through his body, the church, our church. Amen. that time in our worship service when we demonstrate our unity in Christ, our unity to serve and do the mission of this church in this place. Let us now give generously so that we can continue that mission.
join me now in our prayer of consecration and dedication. God, as we seek to keep our focus on you as revealed to us through Jesus the Christ, we pray your blessings upon these gifts, offerings, and pledges. Guide us with wisdom and compassion, for you have called this congregation to be co-laborers with Christ in the mission of bringing your reign to fruition. Amen. No matter how weak or how frightened we may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in the world. In this coming week, may you do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, and to do the work of justice and love. In so doing, you will be following the way of Christ. You will be the church. Amen. If you would please stay for following the, the benediction for the annual meeting, you may be seated.